Hey everybody, welcome back to Bob Key TV time. Once again for the broom wagon. A lot of ground to cover in the Musette Musings. Tweet of the week, of course. No racing to report, but we're going to start out with some Jersey reviews for 2017. All of that coming up next on the broom wagon. Okay, everybody, let's get into the jerseys. We're going to see in the Pro Peloton in 2017. Next up, BMC. BMC, one of the sharpest jerseys historically. Very snappy red and black kit. Um, those guys have always looked sharp. Uh, new clothing sponsor and new co-sponsor. Big news for the BMC squad. Tag Heuer, the watchmaker from Switzerland, will be a co-sponsor of the team. And I'm happy to report that Tag Heuer was brought into the sport by my team, 7-Eleven, many, many years ago. And I still have the original Tag Heuer that I was given way back in 1986. So a bit of a long hiatus for Tag Heuer, but back in the sport at the highest level with the BMC squad. The jerseys for next year, very similar, um, except for the sleeves. Well, you'll have a white background on top of uh, a black on one side and red on the other side background uh, for the logo. It's Tag Heuer, classic Swiss watch brand, been around for decades. They make great watches. Um, it wouldn't surprise me <laughs> if how the Tag Heuer logo is represented on the sleeves does not change a little bit. It wouldn't surprise me if it changes a bit. Um, uh, in my way of thinking, if the whole sleeve was white, rather than uh, red on one side and black on the other side background before the logo, if the sleeves were a little bit different and just had a, a, a white background and the Tag Heuer logo on the side. Um, but very similar to last year with that addition, and I think they're going to look good and race very quickly again in 2017. Uh, best of luck for Tag Heuer um, and the boys from BMC. Also, the Orica, no, it was <laughs> Green Edge, and then it was Bike Exchange. Now it is Orica Scott. Scott Bikes, some of uh, the best looking and fastest bikes in the world, will be the co-sponsor. So moving up a little bit to really support the Orica um, Scott team. And a significantly different jersey also. Predominantly a very sharp dark blue, navy blue background, and Scott highlighted uh, in what you could call neon yellow greenish uh, across the chest, and uh, a very, very good looking jersey. And, um, and Scott stepping up to co-sponsor the squad. And Scott had two teams in the World Tour last year, um, the IAM Cycling Squad as well as, well as Orica. And the riders love the bicycles provided for them. Uh, they have rave about the bikes that they've been riding for the last few years on the Orica squad from Scott. And so that will continue again. One of my favorite jerseys so far, the Orica Scott team look very, very sharp. I might buy that kit if it comes out in replica form at some point uh, because it looks that good. That's maybe one of the few I would actually spend money on in all of professional cycling. <laughs> uh, but nobody would mistake me as one of the sponsored riders. <laughs> no matter what amount of team kit I had, but uh, maybe in my younger days they would have. <laughs> all right, everybody, next up, the Musit Musings. Okay, everybody, first up in the Musit Musings, the UCI has responded to the ASO and RCS and Vlanderen race organizers apparently request to reduce the numbers in the Grand Tours from nine to eight riders per team and in the one day classics from eight to seven riders. Uh, so UCI saying they will not allow less than nine riders in the Grand Tours and eight riders per team in the one-day classics in next year's race season. Um, I didn't know from the initial uh, announcement from the ASO that it was a request. It seemed to me <laughs> that
that they said, this is how it's going to be. And the UCI is representing it as a request made by the race organizers. RCS, by the way, the, the uh, owners and organizers of the Giro d'Italia, Tour of Lombardia, uh, Tirreno Adriatico, Milano San Remo. Um, so, <laughs> if indeed it was a request from the ASO and RCS, uh, and the UCI said, no, we're going to stick, we're going to keep it at nine for the Grand Tours, um, that would be a bit of a surprise to me. <laughs> if the ASO makes another announcement along with RCS that we are having eight riders in our race, that's what you're going to see in the Giro and the Tour. <laughs> You're going to see the same number of teams with one less rider each. And this is not for safety reasons. Let's be honest. This is to make the race more competitive. So one team, and you can read Team Sky into that if you'd like, <laughs> uh, having one less rider to control the proceedings. And so they're hoping that by reducing the number, and I think that they have some uh, merit that has some merit to it that could actually stimulate some more aggressive riding and be much more difficult for one team to control the proceedings out, the, out of the three weeks. Uh, so um, one of the flaws in that logic is that all the other teams will also have one less rider. So whether that changes the tactical dynamics remains to be seen. But I said previously, I'd like to see that change put into effect. If it works, keep it. If it doesn't work, and it's more of the status quo, and there's a lot of collusion between teams, which I see as a potential problem uh, moving forward, then they abandon that and go back to nine riders. But I don't see why we can't give it a try for one Giro, one Tour de France. <laughs> the Giro occurring earlier in the season, Perhaps the Giro tries it, and if it's a disaster, the ASO, uh, ASO abandons it for the Tour de France, and we go back to nine riders. But <laughs> uh, that remains to be seen. But historically, if we recall, usually when the ASO says what they're going to do with their race, the Tour de France, it generally happens. So look for that change so far in 2017. Bad news for the riders formally on the Lamprey squad, uh, and now a new team, but with the Lamprey team's license called TJ Sport, was going to come into the sport, uh, take over the title sponsorship from what was Lamprey Merida. Merida has changed teams to be a part of the Bahrain team with Vincenzo Nibali. Some of the former Lamprey riders, um, Diego Ulisi, um, Louis Menkes and um, Rui Costa had stayed with the team when they found a new sponsor. TJ Sports, it was called. Uh, I believe it is a group of manufacturing and athletic products from China. So they found a new sponsor, a new investor in the team, and it was not going to be an Italian team, obviously. And it would be pretty heartbreaking for the world tour not to have one single Italian team in the whole sport. Um, uh, but the management, uh, which is Giuseppe Saroni, team manager, was going to stay with the team moving forward. And Colnago, the bicycle manufacturer, was going to become one of the co-sponsors of the team. Apparently, the paperwork uh, and... The salaries had not been uh, finalized by TJ Sport. They hadn't done the paperwork to make the application to the UCI. And so it was questionable, and it remains questionable, whether or not TJ Sport is going to move forward as a team. They canceled their training camps for December in light of that. And it looked like, until today, it looked like the team might vanish before they ever got started. TJ Sport apparently has decided not to sponsor the team moving forward. And the team was in danger of losing their chance to race at, the, at, at any level, especially the World Tour. Colnago apparently now has found another backer, has brought in another 
presenting uh, principal sponsor of the squad. Rumor has it it's Abu Dhabi. Um, another rumor su suggests it's Dubai. And RCS, the owners of the Giro d'Italia, have promoted races in Abu Dhabi and Dubai um, uh, that are sponsored by those countries' governments, presumably. So watch for that uh, in the future. It wouldn't surprise me if that's just a rumor and that they don't have any funding and that team folds, which would be a real disaster for everybody involved. involved. You're talking about 55, 60 jobs when you look at the whole squad, and uh, it would be a real shame if they were to vanish from the sport. Um, cycling, the business model, <laughs> continues to be very, very challenging. There's no geographic center, which is very unlike other sports. Um, there are some sports that are similar. Um, uh, golf, a little bit tennis a little bit, Formula One, maybe the closest analogy you can draw to cycling compared to stick and ball sports. Um, soccer across the world, there's a stadium <laughs> in a city <laughs> that's the name of the club where the teams play. Same with football, baseball, basketball, hockey. So um, that's a big difference with cycling. So because of that, cycling is a much more fluid, uh, ever-changing difficult to um, identify with a specific um, geographic uh, point. That might be part of the solution to a very challenging business model for professional cycling. Ideally, you're so good at your job and that your sponsorship is so visible that your efforts winning races translates for that sponsor into increased revenue. <laughs> What's odd, <laughs> the teams like Astana, like Katusha, like Edix, like Slipstream, they're not selling anything. They're hoping to sell something, um, presumably. And, and so, when people say the business model is a disaster in cycling, it's very challenging to get people to buy the products that are sponsoring the teams whose uh, visibility is increased. FDJ is a lottery. I'm not sure people play the lottery more or less because they sponsor a cycling team. And, uh, and it's just one of those esoteric concerns in cycling that drive people crazy. <laughs> Motorola, one of my sponsors on the road, uh, and the principal sponsor uh, that took over from 7-Eleven, wanted to expand their business in Europe, and they thought that a cycling team was the most cost-effective way to do that. I don't know if it worked. <laughs> in all honesty, uh, you'd have to ask Motorola about that. Um, so, if it did, if the visibility and, uh, you know, you're talking about some of the greatest bike racers ever that were on the Mo Motorola squad. Phil Anderson, uh, Andy Hampston, uh, Steve Bauer were all teammates of mine when I was on Motorola. So um, they stuck to it for the f as long as they thought that it was economically viable. And that turned out to be five years. And five years is, is uh, not nearly long enough to develop a cohesive program whereby athletes can be developed, mature, advance, and improve and become competitive. Five years is not nearly enough. I think the minimum is 10 years to develop athletes and have something whereby people can identify with the team year in and year out for a number of years. We don't have that in cycling. Pittsburgh Steelers have that, you know. Uh, Golden State Warriors. Like, name any team that plays in a stadium, and it's a very different concern. So, I've tried <laughs> to wrap my head around possible solutions. And what I've come up with um, is that you have to be committed to poverty. <laughs> a guy like Peter Sagan, or Chris Froome, or Mark Cavendish, or Tom Bonin, if they were 
as good as they are at cycling in any other sport, they would be making 10 to 20 to 30 times more than they are as bike racers. So even the very best of the best have to be in a certain way committed to poverty. <laughs> this is what I recommend. Ride bikes for recreation and get a real job. <laughs> The superstars, the Nibelis, the Quintanas, the Frooms are making plenty of money. But that is a tiny percentage of the entire peloton. And a lot of riders, uh, when they finish uh, sacrificing for their team stars, um, have a very difficult time making ends meet. And there's no uh, retirement. And maybe that's good in a lot of cases. Um, uh, so... The business model in cycling is not going to improve for the foreseeable future. So commit to poverty and enjoy the show. <laughs> Maybe that's not good news. But listen, if you're one of the 60 guys that's on Lamprey last year and you're hoping that um, you're going to be on TJ Sport next year, ah, that's a disaster. So now hopefully if this team doesn't happen, those riders and mechanics and drivers and soigneurs will be able to find uh, jobs. And, you know, it's not a lot of jobs in the world tour, but in the pro continental and continental levels, hopefully they can all get employed and another team might step forward and um, provide uh, another sponsorship base where they all can come back to the highest level of the sport. Lamprey has been, um, a team that has, in all honesty, struggled against the best. And they have some great riders and don't seem to have what it takes to win the big races. And consequently, a hard situation is made even more difficult in securing title sponsorship funding. It is a tough world in bike racing. It's maybe the toughest sport that's as popular as it is worldwide for the athletes to get paid well consistently and without worrying. If you're the best soccer player, um, you're number one, making bajillions of dollars. And number two, it's never going to happen. But if let's say Real Madrid folds, you go to Barcelona or, or Milan Inter or Juventus or Man, you anywhere in the world, it's not, it's not, it's not a problem. If you're Rui Costa, champion of the world, um, and a tremendous cyclist, winner of the Tour of Switzerland three times, I believe, uh, many stages in the Tour de France, your team folds. <laughs> Every other team is full. No other team has extra budget to pay you what you're worth. If your team folds, it's a disaster. Even if you can get a job on another team at the last minute, that is a disastrous business model and one that doesn't look like it's going to change in the near future. Um, so sometimes a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. So if you have an offer, I suggest you take it if you're a professional bike racer. All right. <laughs> Enough of that. Romain Bardet will not be doing the Giro uh, in 2017. His focus is going to stay with the Tour de France. I think that's prudent. He was second last year. Brilliant ride. Uh, he races for a French team. He's from France. There's no reason for him to risk uh, a completely different program in the hopes that he does well in the Giro and does, continues to race well in the Tour de France. It's, it's not, in this day and age, it's just not feasible. It, it, we don't see that nowadays. A rider... Uh, and Chris Froome had a similar uh, conversation earlier with the press, and he the route looked tempting, but ultimately decided to focus on the Tour de France and keep his program very similar to years past when he's won three. So Romain Bardet, I don't think this point, at this point, still developing, still has a long ways to go and a lot of improvement to make. I don't think it's a good idea for him to focus on the Giro. <laughs> uh, so, and also it'll be interesting to see his progress in 2017 compared to 2016 when he was second with the stage win at the Tour. Brilliant ride. 
Um, and he's the closest thing the French have currently to a rider that can win the Tour de France. So uh, he'll be focusing that for the foreseeable future until perhaps that is not feasible. And then maybe we'll see him focus on the Giro d'Italia. Joaquin Rodriguez retired, and it was a pretty brilliant uh, final season for Rodriguez. Um, he uh, went to the Olympics, retired after the Olympics, and then, amazingly, <laughs> had decided to come back into professional cycling uh, to race for the Bahrain Merida squad and be teammates with um, Vincenzo Nibali and J-Rod. Joaquin Rodriguez is a threat in every race he enters all year long. And uh, that's a very remarkable bike racer. Can win one-day classics, can win Grand Tours. It didn't happen, but he got very close on a number of occasions. Stages in the Grand Tours, King of the Mountain, etc., etc. An incredibly dynamic asset to have for any team. He's decided to go back into retirement. <laughs> and so, uh, best of luck to Joaquin Rodriguez in the future. I was kind of looking forward to seeing what it would be like for him to be teammates with Vincenzo Nibali. And I'm sure if he was able to commit and still had the good legs, which he seems to be pretty capable to the last moment of his career, um, would have been a huge help to uh, Vincenzo Nibali. But that's not going to happen. And best of luck to Joaquin Rodriguez, whatever he decides to do in retirement. Uh, no positive tests from the 2016 Tour de France. Great news from the Tour. Um, I think uh, it was a little bit odd that they hadn't announced that until the Volta announced that there was no positives in the Volta. So great news coming out of the Tour. Um, Chris Froome's contention that his jerseys will stand the test of time seems to be true so far. And so, um, I mean, we should be thrilled with this headline coming out of ASO that there were no riders using drugs to race in the Tour de France. And um, it makes me hopeful that moving forward, that part of our business model is much more stable than it has been in the past. <laughs> and so I'd like to say a tip of the hat to all the riders that raced the Tour de France clean in 2016. All right, everybody. Uh, next up is uh, my favorite part of um, the broom wagon, <laughs> the tweet of the week. Okay, everybody, tweet of the week coming to us from Chad Haga. He is on the Giant Squad. They're going to be called the Sunweb Squad next year, so um, a little confusing. <laughs> If I'm not mistaken, they'll still be on Giant Bicycles, but they've recently gone back uh, to train in Spain. And this is a bittersweet moment for Chad, Chad Hoggett coming around the same corner. Um, and uh, this is exactly where a car was coming in the lane that the team was training on including Warren Bargui and John Degenkolb. And you can see how narrow it is. And it's a totally blind corner. And can you imagine a car coming at you right now at 100 kilometers an hour? Uh, so I, it's funny. When I go back to Europe and I go down a stretch of road where I've crashed, I remember it to this day. And the hair on the back of my neck stands up and... Um, those are moments that you can't forget, um, and that's indicative of how emotionally, um, how connected we are to our emotional landscape as well, and that uh, physically, bike racers are some of the toughest athletes on the planet, physically and emotionally, and when you're on the open road, anything can happen. Let's hope that never happens again to uh, any of the pro riders or any riders out there. Um, be aware, be careful, wear your helmet, and have a great bike ride. That's it for the broom wagon. Please comment. I love to read the comments. Uh, I'm gonna start responding <laughs> to any questions that people have, uh, and uh, look for those in some videos to come. 
I thank everybody for tuning in to Bob Key TV. 2016 is almost over. 2017 is going to be fabulous. And keep on trucking. That's my advice. Uh, no matter what happens, when you're well, get out on the bike and enjoy the open road. Click on my face to subscribe. Click on the t-shirts if you'd like to buy some merchandise. Please give me the thumbs up if you appreciate these videos. Follow me on Facebook and Twitter. All right, everybody. Until next time.